Hey everybody, welcome to the Face to Face Ministries podcast, the number one resource for learning what it means to have a healed heart, connect more deeply with Jesus, and experience true and lasting transformation in your life. I'm one of your hosts, Kathy Little. And I'm your other host, Melinda Wilson. Please hit subscribe so you don't miss the fresh content we're continuing to release. And while you're at it, we greatly appreciate your help in getting the word out by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a quick review. You can also keep up with us by following our social media by searching face2faceministries.org on Facebook. That's no spaces, no numbers, and no caps. And on Instagram at face 2 min, and that's all one word. We want to invite you to join us in our free face-to-face heart healing network and in our premium network. Be part of a growing community of people just like you who are wanting to dive deeper into what it means to access the full benefits package of the cross and learning how to help others do the same. Our team also offers one-on-one ministry sessions that can be done virtually, and you can also learn how to help others connect with Jesus and find healing in their lives through training we offer in the ministry model we use. And for more information about all of the resources, trainings, and events that we offer, visit face2faceministries.org. And while you're there, please sign up for our newsletter. All right, so let's dive into today's episode. Welcome to episode 113, y'all. We are on our way out of town, so we're going to be nice and quick and slick on this one. Melinda, how are you doing tonight? And don't be happy about that, y'all. Be sad. (laughs) Be very, very sad. Yeah, it is late. And Kathy, who is the perpetual, like, get this done, grind it out. It's still a day late. (laughs) It is. But you know what? Do you guys care? I bet you're just grateful. I think some people do. I don't know. Okay, well... Who noticed, raise your hand if you <laughs> if you noticed that it didn't come out on Tuesday. I'm just saying. Uh, yes, it's being released Wednesday because Kathy will be editing it until, I don't know, 1232 to this morning. But if we keep talking, I'm not going to get to editing. But it is, we are, uh, speaking of getting to somewhere, we're actually heading to Virginia tomorrow, which is February 2nd, 2022, by the time you listen to this or when you're listening to this on to do and a manual training. And then, uh, gosh, we do a quick turnaround. We get home, we're home a day, just enough to unpack and pack. <laughs> and then off to Montana. <laughs> Super early. <laughs> so excited. Y'all, y'all join us in Montana. It's actually not too late to join us in Virginia. Yeah. And it's not to come to Montana in, you know, February, we're like, why would you go? Why not? It's beautiful. Flathead Lake is the area where we're going to be for this training two day anybody deeper in who wants deeper intimacy with Jesus come to the training. And yes. then what's after that? Well, we've got Austin, Texas coming up the first weekend in March. And then March 26th, we're going to be here in our hometown. Come and meet us. We're going to do something a little differently instead of branding it as the manual approach for people who might want to learn the tools to help others. This is just straight up encountering Emmanuel, all the basics, for everyone. And we're hoping to have a good crowd for that in person here in Simpsonville, South Carolina, where we now live. But we also are going to offer that via live stream because we want to get the word out. So be looking for information on that. Anything that we've got live ready to go uh, for registration is on our website, face2faceministries.org forward slash training dash events. And then on the heels of that, the first week of April, ladies come to dash, dash away, away. Yeah. not in Lake Tahoe. That is ha- coming up in that July. That is coming up in July. But for you East coast, anywhere West of like Denver, I mean, sorry, East of Denver, <laughs> come to Moravian Falls, North Carolina, beautiful, yeah. holy, historically, historically holy place. Yeah. For Dashaway. I've never been and I'm very excited about being there. I've lived close to it and never went. So this is very exciting for me as well. We're going to be in Apple Hill Lodge in Moravian Falls. And there is a f- sale on right now, an early bird sale. sale and you get $50 off. So listen, bring a friend, come. Space is limited. We have a smaller venue. So space is limited. Sign up today. And with that, we're going to run right into our guest, which I hope you will love. This guy was, man, such a tender hearted man who really is wanting to help the church be prepared to receive the wounded. We talk about that and also just understanding our identity and uh, walking into wholeness 
in Jesus. So uh, who is our guest today, Melinda? Yeah, this gentleman's name is Dave Warnley, and he has a ministry called Identity in Wholeness. And we're really privileged to have him as a guest. We enjoyed hearing his heart. And, yeah. again, you know, it's always wonderful to, and, and a blessing and an honor to meet a gentleman who is so, um, has such a heart to see people healed. Yeah. And we appreciated the time spent with him and know that you will too. Yeah. So here's our interview with Dave and uh, we hope to see you guys soon in person at one of our trainings or dash away for you ladies. And uh, here we Come go. On, Enjoy. Y'all. Thank you well, both for having me on. Yeah. So and good to meet you. We are really honored to have you, Dave, with us. And I was sharing before we press record how encouraging it is when guys are kind of leading the way in inner healing. And obviously you've done and are doing your own work, which is set such a phenomenal example for guys that this is this inner healing thing is not this ooey gooey emotional charged women's little huddle thing. <laughs> this is for, for everybody. And so Dave, I'm just curious what prompted you or motivated you to reach out to us and then just share with us and the audience about your own healing journey. Well, thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to finally meet both of you and, and be on here. I was looking for podcasts that talked about inner healing and uh, trying to get our message out there. My wife and I do this together, trying to get our message out there to a wider audience um, because it's so needed. It's so needed. I believe revival is coming and uh, the church needs to be, we, we need to learn how to embrace the wounded when they come in and to recognize that we're wounded and need healing. It's so much easier to fix somebody else you know, than, than me. It's so much easier to work on your problem than mine. So our, our charter is kind of to help the church learn how to embrace the wounded. And mm-hmm. for individuals, so we kind of have a two-pronged charter. For, for churches, we, we help churches learn how to embrace the wounded. Mm-hmm. Um, and for individuals, we help discourage Christians hear God for real uh, in their lives so they can live with bold purpose on purpose. Uh, you so much of so many of us are just drifting through life in our brokenness and just trying to hurt a little less today than we did yesterday. Uh, mm-hmm. But God has so much more than that. God has so much more than just existing. He wants us to thrive. He wants us to live the adventure He called us to live. Um, I, my wife and I, both come out of a lot of brokenness, um, a lot of hurt. Nothing in in my story. Nothing really bad happened. I had a Christian home. I had a, a great dad. But I learned when when I was growing up and I'd go to play a game or, you know, ask my, you know, he was he was an account, he did a lot of accounting. He'd always be at the adding on the kitchen table at the adding machine, you know, before they had computers and spreadsheets and everything. And uh, if I wanted him to play a game, I'd ask him to play cribbage because he couldn't resist playing a game of cribbage. He would stop. He would drop what he was doing. He'd play a game of cribbage with me. But if I asked him to play Battleship or Subsearch or one of these other silly board games that was my game, my preference. Is well, he was too busy for that. Um, but if I wanted to play catch or cribbage or something that he liked, well, he he would do that. And he was a really good dad. I don't don't want to imply otherwise. Good Christian man taught me a lot about the Lord. But I I learned in that wrongly that my preferences weren't important, and so I made this inner judgment inside. Other people's preferences are important, but not mm. mine. My preferences mm. are important. Then, then you get in the church, you grow up in the church, and it's all about dying to self, right? So I'm not important. <laughs> Other people are important. That set me up to make some poor choices in my life. I, I ended up in, in a marriage that was very hurtful, was, was a disaster. I ended up marrying a narcissist. Um, and it was the classic, uh, what, what Danny Silk calls the T-Rex and the goat, you know, the, the aggressive controller and the passive. And I was the passive one. I was the goat. But in a dysfunctional relationship, both people are getting something out of it. And the thing I got out of it was every, anybody could look at it and see she was the villain, you know, and I was, I was the martyr. I, get to, I got to be the mm-hmm. martyr. But that's just as dysfunctional. Because as, as you guys know, doing, doing relationships and healing in, in relationships, sick attracts sick. Um, and then when one person gets healthy, the other person now has a choice. 
you know, so, so I got healthy because it was ready. But then the other person now has a choice. If they can't bully you back into being sick, they can either get healthy themselves or they can leave and they will do one of the two. And it's, it's hard. And that's why my, my wife and I volunteer at a crisis pregnancy center. And we see, um, we see it all the time. People not wanting to leave, not wanting to risk mm -hmm. ending their unhealthy behavior, not wanting to risk getting healthy because they're afraid the other person's going to leave. Mm -hmm. And they might because it gives the other person a choice. We get ready because we're, we're ready. We're sick of being sick. And so we're ready to get healthy. But they may not be ready. They may not be at that place yet. And it kind of it kind of flips over their apple cart. You know, it's like, yeah, I think we had a deal here. You know, we were both getting something out of this dysfunctional arrangement. You flipped over the whole apple cart. What's up with that? But once you've gotten healthy, you can't go back to being sick. Um, so it gives the other person a choice. So, um, so, so my wife ended up leaving after, after 22 years. Um, and I bumped into someone I hadn't uh, seen for gosh, 15 years, she was in our home group. Janet was in our home group at a home group I led at a previous church. Hadn't seen her in 15 years and just randomly bumped into each other at a, at a prayer, at a prayer meeting. Um, and, um, we, we got married in 2013 and the second marriage for both of us, she had been some story, very similar to mine. She had been married to a narcissist as, as well. And so she introduced me to Elijah House, which you guys have probably heard of, uh, founded by John Sanford, and also Restoring the Foundations, mm -hmm. another one founded by the Keisters. Um, I learned from Restoring the Foundation that they have a great definition of shame, that uh, they, they define shame as being uniquely and fatally flawed. Uniquely flawed, I'm the only one who feels this way, and fatally flawed, I can't be fixed. There's, there's no fixing me. Um, and shame is this idea that I am a mistake, whereas godly guilt is I made a mistake. But in the kingdom of God, we're not what we do. And that's the big lie is, is we're not what we do. Yeah. And the world thinks you are what you do. So, Dave, you're obviously very passionate about this and, and have... Uh, it's clear that you guys have, you and your wife, and your wife's name is? Uh, Janet. Janet. You both have walked through, obviously, a lot of pain and have pursued your own healing. And so let's just back up a little bit. Did you, um, after being introduced to these healing models, and yeah, we have interviewed the, uh, well, we've interviewed the founders of um, Storing the Foundations. Obviously, we cannot, couldn't interview the Sanfords, although that would have been certainly right. a huge honor. One day, one right. day when we're, all of us are together. Yeah. But um, so did that bring you, you guys to then start a ministry call? I see it's identity and wholeness. And I love that because that's something that even with the Emmanuel approach, we are finding our identity as those roadblocks to healing are removed and as lies are removed. And as we come into greater identity of, oh, this is who I really am, not that other stuff that was kind of put on me, or I even put on myself through my own wounding or trauma. And so would you share with us just how you came to start? Would you call it a, is it a ministry? Yeah, it's a website right now. So we, we blog, we've been doing Zoom groups once a quarter. We've been doing private Zoom groups um, over 2021. We did one Zoom group a quarter, like eight to 10, 12 weeks. And on the site, there's under, I think the menu is under content Zoom. There, there are links to all of the, the various Zoom groups. All the materials can be downloaded on the site for free. Like Kathy mentioned, the the runt is one of the downloads that's uh, that's available on the site. We have um, to talk about that. I'm so curious about this, <laughs> and I just had a chance. I just had a chance to peruse it just a bit, and I it, it is a free download on your site, and so we're going to have to talk about that because I, I want to hear the story behind that because it's a okay. fable. It's not even a true like it's a fable or a parable, right? Right. Right. Okay. Yeah, well, so, continue on, but we're going to have to talk about the okay. run. <laughs> yeah. So I'm I'm a um, I'm an author. I, I write Christian nonfiction, uh, and I primarily write about identity. 
about the this this identity with Jesus and who he is. I said before, my wife and I volunteer at a crisis pregnancy center, and we see so many people coming into the crisis pregnancy center, single and pregnant, saying, yeah, I'm a, I'm a born-again Christian. I've gone to church all my life, sleeping with my boyfriend. What's the problem? And it's like, okay, there's a disconnect here somewhere. And we, we found that many churches either, either are in bed with the culture and think that's fine or don't talk about it at all. Or when they do talk about it, they get all, be good or God will punish you. God, watching you. And that's not God's heart. It's not the heart of God. It's, so I, I wrote a, a little, just a little three by five mini book that we actually give away at the Pregnancy Center. And it's available on the website also. But it, it's called True Self, uh, Sexual Integrity Out of Intimacy with the Living God. And the idea is once you've done this heart exchange with Jesus, once you have his heart and he has yours, you can't live in a way that breaks his heart. You just can't do it. When you're in the place of having that heart exchange, it's too precious. He's too beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's too precious. You just can't, you, you can't hurt him. You don't want to live in a way that hurts him. Would you share with the listeners just maybe a, a snippet of a testimony from your own life? Like why does this touch you so deeply? And maybe just a and, it, you know, we know we don't have to have dramatic before and after. Like you were saying, you weren't brought up in some traumatic, abusive home or, you know, your parents leaving or but but you noticed those that like you experienced that trauma, a the absence of being affirmed for yes. what yeah. you wanted, what you needed. And even though it didn't seem painful at the time, how you saw the effects of that through your life, but would you share with us um, maybe just a, an example of your life from your life, maybe a particular story? And I, I probably should have um, primed the pump earlier and written you and said, "Hey, can you think of a story?" So if you can't, <laughs> I know I like putting people on the spot because I like being put on the spot. But if you're thinking of something just off the top of your head uh, where you've experienced that, okay, this is what I the pain that I was walking through, and now how. Jesus has helped clear some of that away and I can see different now. It, it, do you have an example from your own life? Yeah, I, I think so. When, when, when my wife and I got married, Jan, when Jan and I got married, I went through, especially after the divorce and everything and, and getting remarried, I went through a season where I was really, really asking what, what was wrong in my heart? What, what, what inner vows have I made in my heart that set me up for s such a disaster that my my first marriage was? What what is there that God wants to heal? And I I went through a lot of Elijah House. I listened to a lot of Graham Cook, restoring the foundations. My my wife Janet just brought in so many good resources. It was so healing. I really discovered I had a really deep sense of self hatred. And so I, I spent a year reading nothing but Psalm 139, which is mm. the, the anti-self-hatred psalm. Um, <laughs> and it's, uh, it, it's such a deeper, it's, it's such a deeper, um, I got such a deeper sense of how Jesus sees me. And it's, if I could just share a little bit with you, I just happen to have a Bible sitting here open to it, coincidentally. <laughs> Please do, please do. <laughs> he he. David says in here. Um, he, he says a lot of things, but um, one of the things that really struck me was you hem me in behind and before you've laid your hand upon me, and that's that's laying your hand in anointing and purpose. That's it's not a smackdown, you know. That's not that kind of laying on of hands. It's laying on of hands of blessing and of of anointing and purpose. Him me and behind and before he knows my past and he knows my future and my past didn't surprise him and it didn't disqualify me because after especially after the divorce i i felt completely disqualified from any any ministry and i had been in a church that folded and it's like okay well pfft. You know, my family blew up, the church blew up, everything blew up. Um, so, you know, disqualified, but he's hemmed me in behind and before. And a little further, he says, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. 
how precious to me are your thoughts with God? And I always thought, how vast is the sum of them? I always thought, yeah, God has a lot of thoughts, you know, and they're precious and they're great. But in my Bible, there's a little footnote on the word too, and it says it could also be translated concerning. And if you read it that way, how precious concerning me are your thoughts, O God? How precious about me, how precious is it that you're thinking about me? How vast is the sum of them? Oh, those thoughts. He has a lot of thoughts about me. It's not just like God. Oh, yeah, God has a lot of thoughts. No, he has a lot of thoughts about me. And the next verse, were I to count them, they'd outnumber the grains of sand. And then he says, when I awake, I'm still with you. And I thought, okay, you're, you're talking about counting sand, and then it's when you're awake, I'm still with you. It's like, that, that's a disconnect. That, that thought fell off the shelf. That, that, that's not connected. But when you think about it, that those thoughts are about me. He's thinking about me. Then it makes sense. Were I to count them, they'd outnumber the grains of sand. You have a lot of thoughts about me. When I wake up, I'm still here with you because you're still here thinking about me. And it changed the way I saw myself. If God loves me, if he's got that many thoughts for me, if he's so excited to start the day and say, yes, this is the day I've made for you. I'm excited about your future. Then who am I to tell him that, that I'm a piece of garbage? Who am I to tell him that what he made doesn't count? Um, so when I went through these hard times, it's like I could, I could give up. I could go live the way of the world. Um, I had a really good job. I could, I could go do everything the world says is, is good. But I couldn't believe that the whole Bible was true for everybody in the world but me. I couldn't believe I was the one person that that book wasn't true for. So I, so I latched on to God and I said, okay, if, if I stay here in this pain, it's going to kill me. But I'm taking you with me. <laughs> You know, I was like, you can have my God when you pry him from my cold, dead fingers because I'm not letting go of you. And he's faithful and he came through and I didn't die. And he brought me through mm. all that pain. And, mm. um, and there's, there's an illustration John Sanford uses that um, being on this side of it and, and looking back, I, I could really appreciate. John Sanford talked about buffaloes and cows on the Colorado plain and the, the thunderstorms come, you know, across the United States from West to East and the cattle and the Buffalo are, are all terrified of the thunderstorm, but the cattle run East. They run away from the thunderstorm. So since the thunderstorm's moving East and they're running East, but it goes faster than they do. And it's behind them. They kind of, they're actually maximizing their time in the storm by trying to avoid it. The Buffalo run west directly into the thunderstorm because when a buffalo is scared they run at the thing they're scared at so if you ever meet a buffalo don't scare it because he's coming at you <laughs> note to self <laughs> yeah right. great advice great advice what did you, you come you away with from hearing, the podcast right? uh if you run into a buffalo don't scare a buffalo <laughs> Uh, well, I, speaking of but they, pain, they, the, they minimize no, their time. Yeah. Since they're running the opposite way of the storm, they minimize their time in the mm -hmm. storm. So mm -hmm. it's this kingdom of God thing, right? Everything's upside down. You <laughs> save your life, you lose it. You lose your life, you save it. If you try to avoid the pain, you maximize your time in the pain. If you run at the pain directly into it, you minimize your time in the pain. And John Sanford put it this way. He said, we have to learn to embrace the fireball of pain. Yeah, and I, I don't know if you've heard of uh, a book called A Grace Disguise by Dr. Jerry Sitzer. He's one of the guys that we interviewed. He uh, was a professor in Spokane at uh, Wentworth University, I believe. Wentworth. Uh, Wentworth, Co Wentworth College. Yeah. But um, he talks about running east into the dark night and allowing uh -huh. the sun to come to you. And mm, when it, I was going in, in my own healing journey, that was so true. And there is so much purpose in pain. There's so much that can happen in that. I, I was just I'm pulling up on my phone here. I just saw this thing, Bob Sorge, another, he's, he's another interview I'd love to have. Bob Sorge is a worship leader guy, very wise and uh, has a, 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 like a 
vocal issue. So it's like a whisper. You have to really intentionally listen mm. to him. But he posted this on his Facebook today. He said, there are some things in the kingdom of God that you will never birth until you're in enough pain. Mm. Whoa, seriously. There are some things in the kingdom of God that you will never birth until you're in enough pain. And that whole process of labor and birth, it's horrible pain, but it's purposeful and it prepares you. So it's very interesting about the the buffalo and the cattle and all of that. I didn't know that that was true of that, but I, I do know that concept of running east into the dark night because the sun is coming mm. to you and it's the shortest duration in there, embracing a purposeful journey of pain because it does birth things in you that may not happen outside of that struggle. Just like a butterfly getting out of the cocoon needs the struggle of getting mm. free so that there's strength in the wings once it's out. So that's that's really powerful. Thank you for sharing that. I love that. I wrote down the name of that book. It's A Grace Disguised by Dr. Jerry Sitzer. A Grace Disguised. Okay. Yeah. It's a great book. It's a little hardback. It's one of the best books on grief I've ever experienced. Oh, wow. Not just mm, read, but cool. experienced. It's fantastic. Yeah. Mm, very cool. Thank you. Should I ask about the, re- the, the run now? <laughs> Melinda, I don't want to cut yeah, you off if you got some run. questions. But uh, I, I just have one other question, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'd love, I, I just would love to hear a little backstory and a little bit about the fable of inner healing called the runt on your website. Can you just talk about okay. that a little bit? So, so yeah. So on the website, there's a free download called the runt. It's identity and slash the runt. And we do a zoom group periodically where we go through the book. So you could get on the wait list. Um, but in the meantime, you can download the book for free. You can download the ebook for free. It's a short read. It's 12 chapters. There's lots of pictures, big font. It's, it's not a long read. Each chapter is only a few pages, so it's, it's a pretty fast read. But I, I wanted to write, as, as a Christian author, I love the subject. I wanted to write about inner healing, and I started to write about inner healing. I, and I was reading my own writing, and I thought, this is really boring. <laughs> Not doing this well. <laughs> it's like, yeah, there's, there's facts, and there's inner vows, and bitter root expectations, and you know the physics of relationships, and you, you know all of this. But how can I do this more interesting? And I remembered a while ago, I had, I had read, um, it was a business book, actually, some guy had, uh, Patrick Vincioni, I think, something like that, wrote, wrote a story called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And he wrote it as a fable. And because he wrote it as a fable, it was really interesting. There were characters in the story, they'd have dialogues. And he'd express through dialogues the things he wanted to bring out in, in the, uh, uh, to the reader. And I thought, you know, I wonder if you could do that with inner healing. So I was, I was um, on, the, on the treadmill at, a, at our local gym doing, doing a run because it was cold outside. And the, this treadmill had a screen where you could like pick where you're running through. So in like the winter, you could run through the Swiss Alps or, you, you know. But one of, the, one of the things you could run through was a, a slot canyon in Vermilion Cliffs, New Mexico, I think it is. And so I, I got thinking about life in a slot canyon and what that would look like. And this whole thing of, of doing a um, kind of a fable of inner healing and showing the principles of inner healing in a story instead of as a textbook might be more accessible for people. Um, and we went through this as a Zoom group last year, and it was really impactful for everybody who took the, who took the Zoom group. Um, but I'm, I'm curious to have you read the story and uh, see what you think. Because I don't want to give any spoilers, but things are not as they seem. And as you get to the end, <laughs> it's kind of like the kingdom of God. You know, everything kind of gets flipped on its head. And, uh, but, That's awesome. But, but they, yeah. they, again, can find that for free download on your website. And your website, again, is? Identityandwholeness.com. Okay. Uh, slash. The and then slash the, the run. Awesome. Right. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Dave, you had mentioned at the beginning of the conversation that your heart, part of that is to help the church embrace the wounded and that whole concept of revival coming and, and even, um, you know, Bob Jones, a prophet a few years ago, saw that harvest of a billion soul harvest. And, and that was 
pre-COVID and things have heated up a lot since then. And we've been talking for the last two years among inner other inner healing leaders that we need to prepare for the harvest coming in of people getting saved or, you know, at least introduced to Jesus, but all the brokenness that's there and all the healing that will need to happen. And so what you're saying is something that, you know, we're kind of like, okay, what does that look like? And all of us in our different ways are doing our bit, I guess, if you will, to train people, to equip people, to be prepared, um, to be able to be ministers of his healing. But I would like to hear from you what, um, how are you or what's on your heart to help the church um, not only invite in or recognize the wounded, but to embrace the wounded, not to be afraid of them? How, how does that look like mm-hmm. for you or what does that look like for you? I'm exploring in the next year, um, possibly doing some speaking and some kind of daily, uh, you know, a day seminar on this topic to help churches learn how to em- embrace the wounded. Um, I have a video series uh, on the website um, called Having Hard Conversations. Uh, so identityandwholeness.com slash HHC. Um, there are, there's, I, I covered two topics. I covered depression, specifically how we can make the church a safe place for people suffering from depression. Uh, there's five videos, all five to eight minutes long. They're short. Um, and then I also covered post-abortive and how to make the church a safe place for post-abortive people. Um, again, five videos, all five to eight minutes long. Um, and I, uh, for the depression series, I have a couple of uh, author friends who are brilliant authors and have suffered from depression. They agreed to be on the, um, the, the videos and, and talk about their experiences and what really helps, what, what helps them and what hasn't helped them. And on the, the post-abortive videos, uh, my wife and I volunteer with the Rachel's Vineyard team in Richmond, Virginia. So I interviewed our, our team, the leaders of our team. And um, so that's kind of where this idea started. And I kind of came up with, with basically five things for each one. But, but the idea is when somebody's wounded, so much of it is about validating their pain and just sitting with them in the pain. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think we want to be helpful. I think church people want to be helpful, but we don't know how. So mm-hmm. what we do is we end up saying, uh, we end up, we end up trying to help them and counterintuitively, the best way to help them is not help them <laughs> because when we try to help them, we're not helping them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're, what we're doing yeah. is we're minimizing their pain. We're trivializing their pain. Oh, you you know you're you're depressed. Well, Elijah was depressed, and he just needed a nap. So go home and sleep, and I'm sure you'll be fine. Not helpful. Yeah, yeah. You know, not, not helpful. Or he, you know, oh, I I was sad once for a while, and I spent you know a year yeah. in Psalm 139. So if you're depressed, you need to just spend a year right. in Psalm 139, like I right. Because um, right. what worked for me, it worked for you. Because people are yeah. all the same, right? You know. No, no, everyone's different. Everyone has something different going on in their life. And the thing is, when we do that, when we say, oh, read this book or read these verses or, you know, do the do the magic thing, we're setting them up for failure because what if it doesn't work for mm-hmm. them? Because God doing something different with them, God wants to do something different. We set them up for failure. Oh, gee, gee, it worked for John, but it didn't work for me. There must really be something wrong with me. And so now I've just reinforced their mm-hmm. depression. Mm-hmm. When instead, what we want to do is listen, listen to their story. Mm-hmm. I think there's a great model in the book of Job. Job's three friends get a bad rap most of the time, and rightfully mm-hmm. so. But at the beginning, they get they got it right. They got it right for a whole week when they just came and they sat with him in the ashes of his life. They sat with him in the ashes of his life, and they didn't say anything for a whole week. And they just were with him. Mm-hmm. And then they opened their mouths and it was all downhill from there. <laughs> but I, I think when people are going through, you know, their, their Psalm 23 moment, the valley of the shadow of death, we want to try to find them an off ramp and pull them out, you know, 
and we want to we want to find them an off rep out of the valley of the shadow of death, you know, and that's and that's good because we're hurting for them, and that's good, but that's not the gospel. Jesus doesn't try to take us out of the pain; he walks with us through it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we need well, to do is learn to walk with people through their pain and say, right, that must be really hard. Thank you for sharing that with me. Mm-hmm. You're, mm-hmm. you're really brave. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that's really not ever taught in church that I've heard of. It's funny. I, I'm reminded right now of actually when I was, I think, in my early 20s, I was still living in California and we had a course offered called Apples of Gold. And so this was like early nineties, but that whole premise of the scripture and Proverbs, like apples, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a beautiful setting. In other words, those words that are spoken at the right time in the right place in the right context is healing as opposed to, oh my gosh, you'll be fine. Or, you know, how do I address someone that's grieving while they're in a better place or all the horrendous things that people say. But, you know, I think there's a couple reasons for that is one that as Christians, we are, I think, programmed to we've got to have the right answer. And if we don't have the right answer, then, oh, my gosh, what uh, what am I going to do? And that means that maybe Jesus isn't enough. I mean, and then I think that that's a lie that we're believing that if we don't have the right thing to say and the right answer for somebody that's in pain, then we're going to look bad or we're going to make God look bad. And then another is that people just aren't comfortable with someone else's pain Mm -hmm. because it makes them think about their own and it, and it's like, oh, wow. And so I want to make you less uncomfortable because I'm really uncomfortable. And I don't know where we picked up these messages, but it's really prevalent and prominent, I think, within the church and That's, you know, one of the things that we teach as part of the Emmanuel approach is attunement and that whole concept of the withness of someone, the with being with, and that, that the neurological definition of joy, and I know we've said it over and over, but it needs to be reiterated. I think it can't be enough that the joy is knowing someone's glad to be with you, even in, and especially in hardship and pain And that, oh my gosh, you're with me, Dave. I am falling apart and you're not trying to fix me, help me. And I loved actually what I heard from the ladies from Drop Gym there in Medford, Oregon. And I think it was Lou that was teaching. They just run this gym in Medford, but we were going through a training and she said, you know, when we, someone's in pain and we want to comfort them and go give them a hug, we don't hug them to help them to stop crying. We hug them so that they can cry. And that was really a impactful for me because I have felt like that for a long time. I'm like, don't try because of my own trauma uh, as a teenager and people coming along and giving me those glib trite responses that I just wanted to slap people's face, (laughs) totally unhelpful, completely condescending and not with me at all. And so that coming, but it's scary. So I love that one of your mandates, one of your missions goals is to help the church embrace those that are coming in as wounded, because that is the majority of people right now coming off of COVID, you know, of all sorts of mental illness and, and emotional, just not just mental illness, emotional wounding. Uh, whether it's depression or loneliness or isolation, all these things that this has caused. And we just, uh, we need, we need you. I just want to honor you and Janet and what you're doing. Oh, oh, thank you. To educate the church. On- oh, thank you. The, the, the video series has very practical things of what to say and what not to say. Don't say this, but, but say this, here are things you can say. Mm. Um, one of them is you're not a bad Christian for feeling this way because they feel like that. They feel like, oh, I'm, yeah. I've been depressed. I've been, mm. you know, where I'm post board. I'm a bad Christian, you know. So just saying you're not a bad Christian, you know, yeah. is tremendously helpful. Or, um, you know, wow, thank you for sharing that with me. That was really brave. Mm-hmm. Or I'm proud of you for continuing to fight. 
I'm proud of you for, for being in there in the middle of the pain and walking yeah. with them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Honoring their process. Yeah. What would you share just in, in closing, what would you share with those that are wounded right now and hurting and maybe they've been hurt by the church and so they don't know where to go or what to do? What would you share with them? Yeah, we see, we see that a lot. We see a lot of, uh, at, at the Crisis Pregnancy Center where we, we volunteer, uh, my wife serves, she, she's head of the post abortive ministry there, but also serves as consultants for people coming in in crisis pregnancies. And they always ask if they can pray with people. And the, the people who have no spiritual beliefs, never heard of God before, their idea of, of spiritual beliefs is, oh, we should all be nice to each other. You know, that, that's all the religion they've had. They'll let them pray with them. It's like, yeah, you can pray with me. That's great. Pray with me all you want. But the ones who say, no, I don't want you to pray with me are the ones who were raised in the church and no longer go to church because mm. they've got church hurt. The, the disenfranchised ones. And those are the ones that break my heart. Um, but I guess I would say to answer your question to people in pain, especially if you've been hurt by the church, that the church is not Jesus and the, the, the pain that you're walking in, even, even if it was caused by the church, is not Jesus. And Jesus has hope and healing and a life for you. I mean, it's one of those trite things that you want to smack people when, when someone says, you know, oh, Jesus has a wonderful plan for your life because that doesn't help in the middle of the pain. But the truth is Jesus is in the pain. He was in the pain. Song of Songs is a great book for somebody in pain because it starts out with family pain. She's, she's been damaged by her own family. Her own family has taken her land away from her and is making her work theirs. Um, there's things in that book about church hurt where the, the intercessors on the wall, the watchmen on the wall, which are the intercessors, not just church people, but the intercessors in the church who should know inner healing and should know better. Find her in the middle of the night when she's looking for Jesus and beat her up. But at the end, at the end of Song of Songs, she comes out of the desert leaning on her beloved. She comes out of the desert leaning on her beloved. And God has a future for everyone who's wounded. And he wants to walk with you through that place and bring you up out of the desert leaning on him as your beloved. Oh, that is so beautiful and so rich, Dave. Thank you for sharing that. And it's a, a different perspective on Song of Songs and understanding it through the lens of that inner healing picture. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And 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 I I I don't often do this, but I'm just kind of thinking that I just kind of feel like there's probably somebody listening that has been wounded by the church. And I don't know if y'all want to join me in, me in this, but I just feel like standing in proxy and saying, we're sorry. Amen. We, we don't know. We don't have the, have it all figured out and we're broken too. And we're all in journey and process. And so as the church, we're sorry for screwing up and not representing Jesus well, and for causing mm. a greater measure of hurt on what was already very painful. Cause I, I know that happens. I've experienced it myself. So if you need to hear the church apologize, we're just going to stand together, the three of us even now and just say, we're sorry. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And we ask you on behalf of the church for forgiveness. Yes. Yeah. And we are committed to doing this better. We are committed to doing this right and learning as the body of Christ throughout the world to steward people's hearts well, like Jesus yeah. does. Come on. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, thank you, Dave. I, I'm i just really honored to meet you. I know we had some little snafus at the beginning, but I, I knew that it was going to be good. Thank you so much for your time and your grace and 
just uh, for what you're doing in this arena of heart healing and uh, helping the church know what to do and and being the voice that you are in this conversation. Really, thank you for your time today. And Dave, would you remind yeah. people how to get in touch with you and where to find you? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Identity in Wholeness, all one word, dot com is the website. The The ebook we spoke about is slash the runt. Uh, the video series is at slash HHC for having hard conversations. Uh, and my email address is dave at identityandwholeness.com. You can feel free to email me. And you can find me at Facebook at uh, Dave Wernley, W-E-R-N-L-I. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dave. appreciate you're pushing through too. I know that when you first reached Thank out, you. we were in the middle of moving and I said, circle back to me and you did. And then I said, circle back to me again, because I'm completely <laughs> overwhelmed. Thank you so much, Dave. We just really have appreciated oh, being you. with you today. And uh, again, just oh, honor you. what you and Janet are doing and just encourage everyone to check out your uh, website, identityandwholeness.com. I'm sure we'll be in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today. If you're enjoying this podcast, please share it with your friends. And please stay tuned for more great content coming your way.